the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which Yahuwah Elohim had made. And he said to the woman, Is it true that Elohim has said, Do not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We are to eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim has said, Do not eat of it, nor touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall certainly not die, for Elohim knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be like Elohim, knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. And she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Tonight, we'll be talking about some very controversial topics, things that some people are obsessed about and others refuse to talk of. Aliens. Genetically modified organisms. UFOs and flying saucers. We'll talk about the 2012 doomsday prophecies, about fallen angels and ancient Nephilim giants, about extraterrestrial biological entities, DNA cloning, and most importantly, immortality and eternal life. Our brother Lou White in the US has heard a warning from Yahusha concerning all these matters, and it's so important for us to understand before the widespread deception begins. So I pray that Yahusha opens your heart to the words that will be spoken here tonight. You may have to stretch your belief a little in some areas because some of the secrets being revealed here are an absolute blowout. But hang in there, and you who are willing, many of the questions you've had your whole life will be finally answered. My name is Mark. I'm your tour guide. Spiritual beings left their principalities and tampered with human DNA, producing offspring called Nephilim. Evidence reveals that these fallen Malachim are still tampering, and today we've been duped into believing that these bodies are those of aliens from other planets. These spirit beings are still ruling this earth and are immortals. You've probably heard them referred to as demons. They hide behind the false notion that aliens are visiting the earth from distant places in the universe. Their superficial appearance is only a shell 
for interacting with the physical realm. But in fact, they are very powerful beings, disobedient watchers who only seek to control and rule over mankind. UFOs and phantoms are both evidence of immortal spirit beings worshipped by pagan cultures all over the earth. These spirit beings are immortal fallen angels. Their genetic experiments with human DNA have allowed them to possess bodies that people believe to be aliens from another part of the universe. Throughout history, the human race has been deceived about who is really running this planet. It is really an evil, non-corporeal organization of fallen beings, just as scripture explains. They've been at the reins ever since Adam and Chawa left the Gan, Eden. Harshatan offered the rule of Earth's kingdoms to Yahusha, remember? These beings, they cannot reproduce as mankind does, but desire to inhabit flesh. Possession, that is dominion over a living person, is one option for them but they designed other means to accomplish their objective. They desired to leave their own habitation as merely watchers and saw human women as their opportunity to manipulate human DNA and genetically synthesize bodies for themselves. Their objective is to control and rule over mankind and they have received worship through false religious systems of their design. The aliens we commonly see depicted, that is elongated heads and necks, minimal features and sterile, are those physical bodies genetically synthesized to clothe these spiritual beings, making their connection with the physical world as direct as our own. From the writings of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees, we learn that these beings taught men certain skills and they seem to be doing so still. They cannot produce spirits as we were designed to do, that is, produce children. So we are somewhat of a marvel to them These fallen ones used human women to produce the Nephilim, which means fallen. And throughout history, including these more recent photos, you can see how big they are. There is a connection between these beings and ghosts, as well as mediums, yoga, hypnotism, new age, and ufology. The physical aspect of their features can be easily seen in the following stone relief. Notice the elongated heads of the small ones and the way the adults' heads are disguised. The throne of Shatan. The Egyptian king Amenhotep IV and his queen Nefertiti are shown here holding their three children. Note the eyes but also the elongated heads and necks. All the children have this odd characteristic. Could this be early evidence of genetic engineering by the same beings that enslaved Israel? Certainly, the technological advances we've seen over the last century indicate there is an accelerated effort 
to build seriously destructive weaponry and propulsion systems to deliver their sting. The aliens, or the fallen Malakim, know their time is short. We are not alone. We share this planet with fallen beings who hide their true nature easily. Their habitation is a higher heaven or dimension and they have interacted with the physical realm since the fall of man. Religion has been one of the fallen Malakim's most useful tools, diverting men to serve them. They feed us with disinformation, both religious and scientific. Some of their propaganda includes pentagrams, candles, smudgings, crucifixes, sacraments, scapulars, talismans, circumambulation, and the false name J-E-S-U-S. -S. They teach us to exchange the profane for the set apart, the unclean for the clean, and control our leaders to make the poorest choices for us, while incrementally strengthening their tyranny over the entire planet. Consistently off balance and confused, we'll believe anything, even that these beings do not exist. The way that people's opinions are shaped is an ancient form of what we what they call sophistry. Now, sophistry is based on the Greek words sophia. Sophia means wisdom, but the sophists, the sophists themselves, would wear they would wear the costumes and the collars. They'd have the collars and the costume, and they would have usually sometimes a little award, a little medal. Uh, and they would stand up as professional speakers and they would be inclined to deceive the people by means of a three-point speech. And they, you hear it from the, especially politicians and, and preachers of Christianity. They will say, well, I've got three points to make here. And those three points give you the idea that they're going to use a depth of knowledge that you would never be able to reach unless you were a sophist yourself. But in reality, what it is, it's just a way of bending things to make it appear a certain way and doing superficial little things. And it makes the listener feel like there's a lot of depth of knowledge. And it's really just superficial nonsense. And, uh, anyway, in convincing the, the audience of an opinion that they are forming in the audience, they, the sophists themselves may not even believe what they're saying, but they're being paid to make these people convinced. Th that's the thing that's going to be used heavily by the aliens when they appear. In other words, when you get the translation, you'll hear this background. That's how you'll know that this ancient Greek technique, which is on Earth and it's not in the rest of the universe, you'll know that this is what is really being done. Because they're not gonna be able to obfuscate around their methodology, because they're gonna use the same methods of deception, only they're gonna have a different subject to, see, to deceive you on. So when you see the sophistry being employed, that's how you'll know it's not really space beings. It may seem arrogant to say so, but it, it is true from the scriptures. We only can go by what scriptures does. And it doesn't mention any other spatial beings than the messengers. The messengers are spatial beings, by the way. They are aliens. So the spirits of these fallen beings that have been thrown down to the earth have been here since, you know, the beginning. And they have been in residence with the authorities and powers because they're controlling the earth right now. And it's only those who can overcome the deception of their, of, see, they make it look like we're doing everything, but it's not true. And uh, so these spatial beings, which we call, uh, we, we know them as spirits, and uh, sorcerers know them as uh, forces. And of course, uh, the force is, uh, you know, used in Star Wars. There are actually spatial beings with incredible powers and abilities but uh, they are limited and they only have permission to do as much as they are permitted to do. They cannot harm unless they're given permission to harm. We see scriptural evidence of that uh, in the book of Eo, for example. Uh, even, you know, the adversary had to get permission to touch Eo. There's so many other galaxies that it would be impossible for someone to conceive of moving from one galaxy to another in a human or or any other form of life. You couldn't preserve it. Uh, and then again, even with our own galaxy, the, ne the nearest star to us is 4.3 uh, 
light years away. And if you, even if you could get to half the speed of light and not manage to bump into any dark matter, <laughs> bumping into anything would be a you know, ca catastrophic. I mean, a, a little uh, grain of sand that hits one of our space capsules is like a 45 shell, you know, a, a, a really serious caliber. You know, it, it does a lot of damage. And uh, if, any, if it's any bigger, it becomes like a cannon, you know. Anyway, moving around uh, in interspatial areas or interstellar areas is unlikely. So uh, anyway, what would be their motivation to come here anyway? I mean, you know, and, and keep pestering us and hiding from us. The actual reason that they are hiding from us is because they don't want to get unmasked. As we look at scripture now and ask the question, are we immortal? Let's analyze how flesh is defined to be a veil. In Hebrews 10, 19 to 29, we read, So brothers, having boldness to enter into the set-apart place by the blood of Yahushua, by a new and living way, which he instituted for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. Yahushua referred to his body as a temple. In John 2, 19, Yahushua answered and said to them, Destroy this dwelling place, and in three days I shall raise it. The flesh is referred to as a temporary dwelling, veil or tent. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1 we read, For we know that if the tent of our earthly house is destroyed, we have a building from Elohim, a house not made with hands, everlasting in the heavens. One part of our makeup can be killed, and another part is unharmed by physical attack. Most people, however, will perish in a second death because they will lack eternal life brought to them by Yahushua. Some have perceived that we are made up of three components, that is mind, body and spirit. Others prefer to admit to two, since the mind is not a separate part of itself. 2,000 years ago, Shaul took advantage of the differences in belief between the Pharisee and Sadducee sects. In Acts chapter 23, verse 8, we see, For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor messenger, nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Some Nazarim and Christians believe that mankind's spirit, that's G5315 Nefesh, is not immortal, subject to die as the flesh is. In contrast, Yahushua, the creator of all things seen and unseen, has declared in Matat Yahu 10.28 And do not fear those who kill the body, that's the flesh, but are unable to kill the being, Nefesh but rather fear him who is able to destroy both being and body in Gehenna. Both in that text indicates two parts and one of the parts is unable to be destroyed except by the one who created it. This being, Nefesh, is what gives life to our flesh. James also speaks of two parts and one is most essential to the other in this hyperbole. And in James chapter 2, 26, we see, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so also the belief is dead without the works. Again, we only see two parts. And the spirit of a person is the unseen, indestructible and vital part of their makeup. 
The flesh is a tent, a veil, a container, or earthen vessel in which a treasure resides. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, And we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the excellence of the power might be of Elohim and not us. Those who have been taught they do not possess an indestructible, that is a deathless component within them, are being tricked by proof texting, that's selecting verses that support a narrow view like the Sadducees had. Yahushua brings us his spirit to join with our spirit, and for us there will be no second death. After the vulnerable part, the flesh, dies, our second part, our spirit, is subject to death also. In John, or Yohanan 6, 54. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood possesses everlasting life, and I shall raise him up in the last day. If we have eternal life in us, part of us is more than immortal due to his presence. There is a certain distinction between immortality and eternal life. We're not really there yet, are we? So we will have to wait before we can comprehend that distinction. The first man, Adam, was immortal, deathless, until he sinned fell, and death entered the universe. Scientists have discovered that the slowing of the speed of light makes distant objects seem to be very ancient, while before the fall, light was probably instantaneous. A dimensional shift or rift occurred between our current lower space realm, that's lower heaven, with the higher one resulting in radical changes in the physical universe. In our inner being, Anafesh, we are able to still perceive eternity because Yahuwah made us with this ability. But our understanding is very limited and our minds are darkened without Yahusha. In 1 John 5, 11-13 And this is the witness that Elohim has given us everlasting life, and this life is in his Son. He who possesses the Son possesses life, but he who does not possess the Son of Elohim does not possess life. I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of Elohim, so that you know that you possess everlasting life, and so that you believe in the name of the Son of Elohim. Believe in the name of the Son of Elohim, it's so important. From this, we may determine that those without belief in the name of Yahusha do not possess eternal life within their spirit, but those who do believe certainly do. Another evidence of us having two parts is seen in the words of Yahusha. John chapter 3, verse 6. That which has been born or begotten of the flesh is flesh, and that which has been born of the spirit is spirit. If our spirit has been begotten of the spirit of Yahusha, we possess eternal life. There are spirits of delusion, and their doctrines permeate all of history. In 1 John chapter 4, 1 to 6. Beloved ones, do not believe every spirit, but prove the spirits, whether they are of Elohim, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of Elohim. Every spirit that confesses that Yahusha has come in the flesh is of Elohim, and every spirit that does not confess that Yahusha has come in the flesh is not of Elohim. And this is the spirit of the anti-Messiah, and now is already in the world. You are of Elohim, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of Elohim, 
The one knowing Elohim hears us. He who is not of Elohim does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of delusion. Well, yeah, there's, a, there's an inner spirit that, that, we, that he created, that we are. And that's what makes us extremely interesting to the messengers, the, the Malachim, because we're interacting with the physical universe, and yet we have something, another component to us that can only be destroyed by the one that made that. And so we've got a spirit and we've got a physical part too. They don't have that. They've just got the spirit, but they've got incredible power and intellect, and of course all that knowledge from the having lived as long as they have since they were created. So we're just babes to them. We look very, uh, you know, and our understandings are very darkened, and our ability to understand too. So we can't really understand everything either because we don't have the brain for it or the mind. Our inner mind is our heart which is the immortal component, but that can't be destroyed. He said, you should fear the one that can destroy the body and the spirit. In other words, the, the body can be destroyed by any, anything, accidents or intentional, uh, whatever, but there's another component that can't be harmed, you know, by even spiritual beings, uh, except by the one that, that created it. And that's the reason that I believe that we do have an immortal component. And that's what makes us intriguing to these fallen messengers. Because they, they can't make more of themselves, but yet we can. So you've made, uh, you've made five little, little spirits. I mean, through you, you were used to make five little spirits. And inside each one of your children, there's a being that's immortal. And uh, their body is, is fragile and, 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 and very mortal. And, de and, and it will eventually die, but the inside the thing that's really valuable is that precious spirit that was put into that vessel. So we are really containers of something very special. See, right now we're not interdimensional beings in the sense that we can use those things, but we are in another dimension in our heart. See, that spirit that is within us is in another dimension, but it's but it's inside the vessel that we call the physical universe too. And so we move together, and when that one goes away, then there's no more contact for that spirit with the, there's no connection with the physical world that we live in and see and breathe air in. But uh, that vessel, that inside, the, the thing that's precious that's inside our vessels, doesn't have to breathe air. And it's not harmed by hot or cold or hunger or thirst. You know, that, that isn't happening, you know. And then we when he restores it to a, another vessel, he, he puts, he, it may come from that and develop it, and, and then we've got a, a new vessel, you know, to be, and it'll be eternal, immortal, and then the ones that are raised and judged and they're not found to be in the scroll of life, that whole, their whole physical being and spiritual being will be destroyed forever in the lake of fire. So they'll actually feel the resurrection and the and what they will what they have and then they're gonna see the fact that they're gonna lose it. And that at that moment they're gonna really realize the loss. I think that my theory is that we receive eternal life only from the one that comes to, to live in us and, and he imparts that. Yeah. I, that's what I lean toward. Now uh, the person that dies I think he has a spirit, even though he doesn't have Yahusha, and that spirit is awakened from a sleep of some kind. And then, but apparently there is something to be said about the fact that that even an unbeliever has a has a, a component within them. But you know, then again, how much are we? He, how, he hasn't revealed it. So anybody that says that they know for sure has to be, uh, you know going out on, on a limb to some large extent. Gabriel, of course, is an immortal, so he's not going to have any aging going on. Neither, neither would we if we were not fallen. But we are we are mortal. Now, the component that's inside us, that we call the heart, or our spirit, is immortal. And, of course, that's controversial with a lot of people. They're taught by their sophistry uh, elders that uh, that's Greek. You know, that's Greek thought, but, you know, everything the pagans believe 
was an error, you know. Spiritualism became popularised after 1818, and perhaps the most famous promoter of it was Arthur Conan Doyle, who lived 1859 to 1930. He was the author of the Sherlock Holmes stories. He claimed to speak with the spirits of the dead, which we know are really fallen Malachim who masquerade in order to deceive. Paranormal phenomena exist all the time. We see hypnosis, mesmerism, ectoplasm, clairvoyance, psychic forces, necromancy. What about that? Witchcraft. And Satanism. <laughs> then we have psychic forces. And seances. There's automatic writing. And demonic possession. We've seen these movies. Demonic possession is all through the movies. Metaphysics. And chi. On you, Bruce. And chakra. And others believe in the Kundalini energy and TM. Pranayama. And there's acupuncture. There's curly and photography. That's where they take a photo of your aura and that madness. And then you've got the, the chants. Om and Om. All this and a host of related terminology are all related to the fallen Malachim, the source of universal power. Several of Doyle's statements bear our scrutiny as we evaluate whether the fallen Malachim are in fact ruling this world. Doyle said, there is nothing as deceptive as an obvious fact. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And he also said, you see, but you do not observe. Before you dismiss the idea that the aliens, that's abductions and flying saucers and Area 51, that's that sign there, and crop circles are in fact part of the interaction of the fallen Malachim with human civilization, before you dismiss that, first admit that it's not impossible. After careful consideration, it is the most probable explanation of all others. Many people who are watching this DVD will never accept that such a huge conspiracy could really be in operation without the secret being revealed. Well, that is what is happening right now. In Matat Yahoo chapter 10, 24 to 28, we see, A taught one is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more those of his household? Therefore do not fear them, for whatever is covered shall be revealed. Don't fear what they say, and whatever is hidden shall be made known. What I say to you in the dark, speak in the light, and what you hear in the ear, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the being, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both being and body in Gehenna. Proclaim it from the rooftops. Don't fear those who don't believe. Matat Yahoo 14, 26 
to 27. And when the taut ones saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a phantom. And from fear they cried. But immediately Yahushua spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Children of the devil and fallen Malachim really exist. Highly organized orders of fallen beings have been and are in complete control of all human governments and religions. Many internet sites concerning UFOs also promote mediums, channeling, and the paranormal topics mentioned. So the fallen beings are all around us. The phantoms fill the skies, and you know they're uh, they're fallen and unfallen. We 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 have protectors. There's a, there's messengers, or what the Greek word is angels, and that means messenger. Uh, Malachim is the Hebrew word, and they're uh, appointed to watch over the children of Adam. You know, <clears throat> and. Uh, we're, they're guardians too. So we, we're guardians and they're guardians. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, we're going to be judging their, uh, their ability to uh, have done their job well, you know. So we have to be careful that we don't do things that are misleading to them either. When we, because they can see us. It's like a little peephole in the, in the fabric of space-time. They can see everything that we do. Now, I don't believe they can read our thoughts. That's just what I believe, though. I don't believe that they know what we're thinking. That's why we, they, we, that's why we can pray silently in our, in our thoughts, and Yahuwah only can read them. He can, only, he can read our thoughts, because He searches minds and hearts. And when He searches our minds and our hearts, which is the same thing, that's our uh, spiritual component. Uh, what our body's doing doesn't matter, but the, the, the fallen messengers cannot possibly uh, read our thoughts. Ezekiel chapter 1 gives evidence that unfallen Malachim exist and great details are provided concerning their movement and appearance. In Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 22 And a likeness, a form or shape was over the heads of the living creatures an expanse like the appearance of an awesome crystal stretched out over their heads. These beings are not technologically superior aliens from another planet, but spiritual beings, two-thirds of which are appointed to watch over mankind's welfare. We need not fear, but rather be strong and courageous as we endure to the end. Be of good courage. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of Yahushua. In Matthew 28, verse 18, and Yahushua came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the set-apart Spirit, teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. Amen. Higher intelligence beings not only exist, but we are warned not to insult, provoke, or vilify them. And that's in Jude one ten and two Peter two twelve, dog. In Jude chapter one nine to ten. But Michael, the chief messenger, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moshe presumed not to bring against him a blasphemous accusation, but said, Yahuwah rebuke you, but these blaspheme, insult, provoke that which they do not know, and that which they know naturally, like unreasoning beasts, in these they corrupt themselves. 
From this, it would seem we would be amiss to get our flesh directly involved in anything spiritually confrontational, but we may intercede spiritually through prayer to Yahusha, acting solely through His authority and not in our flesh. The word blaspheme used above means to insult, provoke or vilify. In fact, we are not to address any spirits directly, nor the dead, which would not hear us anyway. We may only address Yahuwah in the name of Yahusha, and we know His Spirit lives in us to hear us. It's always best to tread carefully, wearing the full armour of Elohim. If we deny their existence, we help their cause. Because if spiritual beings really exist, then it proves that Yahusha is also real. As long as they can maintain their incognito status, people will continue to live in denial. They have certainly been around us long enough to have left some solid evidence behind. So don't dabble in wicked spiritual matters that you know nothing about. It's best to pray and intercede for people if you see the need. Now the spirit of his son is living in those that have submitted to his will and become immersed. And yeah, so the spirit of Yahusha is in each one of his followers all at the same time, which is not a, a possibility for any created being to be there. The people who have been raised in a religion that teaches that Yahusha is like the adversary, uh, like Michael the Archangel, for example. Michael the Archangel, he can't be in more than two places, in one place. He can't, he can't be in two places. So we know that Yahusha is not Michael, you know, because he can't be in more than one place. We know that the Malachim were created to inhabit the dimension of space that is above, and most have assumed it meant another location far above the surface of this planet. But if we think of this above as a higher dimension of space-time, these beings can occupy the space where we are without our perception of them. What about that? They can watch all they want. In fact, our being barred from the Gan Eden may have been simply limiting our access to the higher dimension and a gateway to this higher dimension was blocked, so Adam and Chawa could not return. The offspring of the fallen Malachim, the Nephilim, were also restricted to this lower realm. However, we read that Harshatan, we read that Harshatan, in Job 2, 1 to 2, again, the day came to be that the sons of Elohim, that's the Malachim, the good and the bad, came to present themselves before Yahuwah, and Satan also came among them to present himself before Yahuwah, and Yahuwah said to Satan, From where do you come? And Satan answered Yahuwah and said, From diligently searching in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Up and down. Up and down takes on a different meaning when applied to dimensional space. The fallen Malachim were tampering with genetic materials and using the human women to bring their children to full term. The widespread reports that abductees remember having their genitalia explored seems to underscore the idea that the fallen Malachim are focusing on the same objectives they had both before and after the flood. We know that some of the fallen beings were more ferocious than others, and these were chained in the earth to be released at some point, possibly during the great distress. A fallen Malachim can possess whatever object it pleases, and any spirit can be called an extraterrestrial, since the immortal component we are referring to is non-physical. Even the chains are non-physical. We mustn't think of physical bodies chained within the earth, though, but rather 
that the fallen Malachim are in some kind of forbidden zone, unable to do most of the evil that they could if they were not chained. Those chained spirits are only a small percentage of the total. However, they are the worst. The word Nephilim means fallen one and refers to both the evil spirits and whatever physical entity they may inhabit. A Nephil, singular, doesn't have to be a giant by any means because, as already stated, a fallen one can possess or inhabit any object, living or dead, plant or mineral, that it chooses to reside within. The name Nephil is referring to the spiritual being first and then whatever children they may manufacture are not more spirits but only empty shells to reside in. More on this in next chapter. The main idea with this effort is to be really aware of what we are witnessing when the great signs and wonders occur to deceive the whole world. The delusion will be an event that will be misinterpreted by most people and we are forewarned that what will be seen is according to the working of Harshatan. Most people will not realize what they are witnessing. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 8 to 12, And then the lawless one shall be revealed, whom the master shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and bring to naught with the manifestation of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. with all power and signs and wonders of falsehood and with all deceit of unrighteousness in those perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth in order for them to be saved. And for this reason, Elohim sends them a working of delusion for them to believe the falsehood in order that all should be judged who did not believe the truth but have delighted in unrighteousness. They use people who have accepted the beings to come into them. And we know that more than one can go into a person. Uh, the person in the body, uh, as we understand it from Scripture, is uh, the strong man who already lives in the house. In other words, your house is your body. That's your tent, you know, your tent. And then inside of you is the life force that is you, which we call, you know, the heart, you know, Scripture. And then, of course, that can be pushed aside and controlled by another entity. In our case, we want that control to be Yahusha and let Yahusha speak and act through our bodies. And we become living sacrifices for his use. Now, uh, in the case of a demonically possessed person, that same thing is happening in operation, only they're pushed aside and they allow the demonic force, you know, the being, to... Ex exhibit their will and, and, and use their body to interact with the physical world. There's yeah. uh, so the, the motivation would be to put the demonic forces at, at the highest levels of governing so that the people that who are in government will be able to control the world and using mm -hmm. uh, power and money and sex and all the other things that cause people to, you know, the body of the person to be willing to cooperate, then they would be uh, you know, able to control the world through these people. And it only takes a few people to be controlled like that, to be, and the rest of them can just be deceived, you know. But then I understand that uh, there's a, like when the Nephilim were making bodies for themselves using women. That would be the, the the female egg, of course. All eggs are female, by the way, in case people don't know. Uh, <laughs> the uh, egg is the facilitation for genetic manipulation, you know. And uh, as we know now, genetic, the genetic thing that's going on in the world, uh, all the experiments they're using with uh, changing and splicing genes into from mosquitoes and pigs into into tomatoes and all this sort of thing they're they're creating monstrosities uh, what was that some kind of thing that happened recently in the news that some of us will know about was the alligator snouts that they're, that they're manipulating on chickens 
So the chick doesn't have a beak, it's got an alligator snout now. And they're using, see they're monstrosities. Well, I don't know if there's, I guess, I don't know. But they're, it's really bizarre, and Yahuwah's creation is being meddled with. And this has to play into uh, some form of an abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation is going to be a particular thing, but it's also been going on, too. Because you see, back in Antiochus Epiphany's day, 186 BCE, there, there was an abomination of desolation there, too, because there was something that was in the temple that shouldn't have been there, you know, an image of the, you know, the, the sun deity, as the Greeks worshipped it. But, of course, uh, these abominations... Uh, they're, they're desolating the plant life, too. I mean, all our crops are genetically manipulated. The human cloning experimentation may allow these fallen beings to collaborate together with human scientists. The goal is to manufacture bodies that look identical to our own bodies. We may find ourselves going to a movie and accidentally sit in front of one of these fallen Malachim, dwelling in a body that looks exactly like a regular human. Yahusha's words concerning demonic or fallen Malachim possession are of particular interest. In Matit Yahoo 12, 28 to 30, we read, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of Elohim, then the reign of Elohim has come upon you. Or how is one, a fallen Malachim, able to enter a strong man's house, his body, and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man, and then he shall plunder his house? He who is not with me is against me and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. He describes the possessed person's spirit as a strong man and his body as a strong man's house. If these fallen Malachim can make their own bodies, they can go in and take control over the empty but living shell and drive it like we would a vehicle. The scientists who are not big believers in spirit's existence have no concept of who they are really working with. It's Harshatan's fallen messengers. Things are already in motion and they could produce, or maybe they've already produced, the very person who will receive power on the world stage and destroy incredibly. In Daniel 8, Look, I am making known to you what shall take place in the latter time of the wrath, for at the appointed time shall be the end. The ram which you saw, having two horns, are the sovereigns of Media and Persia, and the male goat is the sovereign of Greece, and the large horn between its eyes is the first sovereign. And that, it was broken, and four stood up in its place, are four rulerships arising out of that nation, but not in its power. And in the latter time of their rule, when the transgressors have filled up their measure, a sovereign, fierce of face and skilled at intrigues, shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty. And that transgressors refers to fallen Malachim. But not by his own power, and he shall destroy incredibly, and shall prosper and thrive, and destroy mighty men, and the set-apart people, and through his skill, he shall make deceit prosper in his hand, and hold himself to be great in his heart, and destroy many who are at ease. And even stand against the prince of princes, yet without hand he shall be broken. What was said in the vision of the evenings and mornings is truth, and hide the vision, for it is after many days. The bodies of the evil spirits may come and go and be of any design, large or small, and the fallen Malachim simply pass into new, fresh bodies. They could look like a slime mold or be fashioned to appear as a beautiful human being 
and be accepted as one of us. Their skill is surely far advanced. The technological level of society we see today, even at its very best, could be over a hundred years behind what is going on between the government and the Extraterrestrial Biological Entity Alliance in places like Area 51 and other sites. Referred to as EBEs, these extraterrestrial biological entities are working with scientists and governments deep underground. The network of huge tunnels and underground cities and bases is held to be at the highest level of security. Cosmic top secret. Mm. GMOs, EBEs. What we call Nephilim of the past are one design and the entities today are called EBEs or GMOs. That's extraterrestrial biological entities or genetically modified organisms. The term extraterrestrial means one outside terror, so it may also apply to spiritual entities. Because they're on the Earth. These fallen Malachim are masquerading as messengers of light, or goodness, or even Torah if they are false teachers, when all the while they are deceiving those they are working with, with the wiles and schemes of the devil. This is all going on, underground. Human cloning for the Malachim to take possession of. Yahuwah designed mankind as well as animals with telomeres, a kind of building platform used in cellular mitosis. Each time a cell divides, a telomere is lost. So when all the telomeres are used, the cell dies of old age. The clones which the fallen Malachim engineer have even greater limitations and it is likely the bodies they inhabit can be sustained for only a decade or two. They simply move in to another house when the time comes. They can possess you if you're not careful and if you don't check your thoughts. Those who are immersed in Yahusha's name and have his spirit living in them have no fear of being overcome. Rather, the fallen Malachim fear us because of him. Being overcome is one thing, but hearing the wrong thoughts and acting on them is another thing. But we don't have to fear about being overcome because Yahusha is in us. He who is in you is greater by far than he who is in the world. Yahusha and his covenant within us is our protector and where the full armor of Elohim comes into play to protect us from the fiery darts of the enemy. Clones, we ask them. We have become walking Torahs and wherever our foot stands upon this earth belongs to us as occupied ground for the good guys. The devils flee because we possess Torah and know how to use it. And that's with Yahusha's constant guidance. Yahusha has overcome the world and will soon take possession of it and reign and we with him. Well, the, the silence of this thing that I, I, when I saw that one in Jerusalem, the way I saw that was it was completely silent. It came down slowly and it was very easily seen. And then it illuminated the domes and various buildings with a perfect, and there was multiple camera angles from people's cell phones and video cameras. So we, we know that they were all, you know, seeing the same object at the same time. 
and uh, the simultaneous, you know, broadcast of various angles of the behavior of this thing, and the, and it was silent. I don't think it was a technological thing. I think it was just like what we would have seen if if we were there when the tomb was uh, the rock was rolled away from the tomb. There was a bright light that was like sustained lightning, and that's what this appeared to be. You know, when this Malachim came down and rolled away the stone, and the the soldiers that were standing there felt the traumatized. You know. Not to, not as much torrified as they should have been. Torrified, but uh, they were traumatized and they were like, they became like like dead men. So uh, this is probably the same sort of thing that we were seeing on video. But I think we're going to see more and more of those things, and some of them will be deceptions, and some of them will be uh, real. They are beings; they're cre created beings, and they can only be in one place at one time. That's one of the nice things about it, because they couldn't ride two horses at the same time or drive two automobiles. One being can only do what one being can do. And they are passing through time. They're not time travelers, but they are interdimensional beings. They're spatial beings, so that they can, they can go from one level of existence down to our lower level that we once fell from. They, they're above us in a higher plane of existence in a higher dimensional space of reality that we are unable to see unless our eyes are open to it, you know.
occult world, Fallen Malachim, are designating the year 2012 for something they are planning. It may be that they fake a rising of Apollyon, or a living giant Nephilim, totally possessed by Harshatan. Who knows? Some have said they expect a resurrection of Nimrod in the year 2012. We will just have to wait and see what deception may be in store for the world. The Mayan prophecy concerning the end of the world on December 21st, 2012 is simply a case of people chasing one another's tails until the topic exploded into a variety of spiritualistic variables. The end is not for any of us to know in advance, but we are to occupy until Yahusha comes. If something happens on December 21st, 2012, it will most likely be the same quiet we experienced on the 1st of the 1st, 2000 at midnight, when the 100th year of the 20th century began. The actual 21st century didn't begin until the 1st of the 1st, 2001. But even that is a date based upon absolutely nothing. Yahuwah doesn't care about the Roman date. He's using a completely different cycle. A character named Jose Aguales was the decoder of the Mayan calendar system. And he was the co-founder of Earth Day and the initiator of the idea of a harmonic convergence, which is stated to occur on December 21st, 2012. While it was Jose Aguiles who popularized 2012 as a special date when the Mayan spacemen of the Galactic Federation would return to usher in some kind of golden age for Earthlings, in the last 22 years since 1998, Aguiles' nonsense has been reconfigured by other pseudoscientists as the end of the world. <laughs> How are you? Hey. How are you been? Yeah, good. I don't know where my mask is. I think it's in the cupboard somewhere. <laughs> wow. I had to hunt for mine. Yeah. 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 Well, anyway. Good time. I made a little flash card yeah. just for the fun of it. Yeah. And uh, here it is. Torah is the school. Love is the lesson. Yeah. It seems like that's uh, being missed. Somehow, yeah, because uh, he's not gonna, you know, Yahusha when he comes back and says, "Okay, what what have you been up to?" He's not going to be going. Well, you didn't get those four levels that explained very well. Uh, what? <laughs> you know, you know, I'm talking about the Talmud's four levels of interpretation, uh, mm. or whatever it might be. I'm glad to, people... I'm glad to clarify that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, I'm really uh, not really interested in the Peshat, mm. except I like the Peshat a lot, mm. but you know, mm. but uh, anyway, what's going on? <laughs> Where's your green screen? Uh, well, I'm mainly on you today. I only wanted some stuff of you. Oh. Uh, for the... Uh, well, you know, they love you though, <laughs> you know, you've got this, uh, oh, that last one you did, oh, it was so good. No. You and Amy, you know. Oh, yeah, I wasn't in the mood that night. She probably came across. Well, <laughs> it was, you know, it was uh, the only real complaint that Phyllis had was that uh, you could barely hear your voice. Uh, you were just barely audible. We yeah. cranked it. You know, because mm. what you were saying, though, was awesome. You know? mm. I'm, yeah. a, I'm a mumbler. <laughs> You're a mumbler. <laughs> well, yeah. let me move this thing out of the way. Oh, yeah. So what do we want to do? Uh, well, I've um, I've sort of mashed together a lot of the old immortality uh, doco and some of the conversations we had last year about aliens and everything. And I was able to put some new footage in of that uh, behind you when you were talking about the um, the U well supposed UFO that came down on J Jerusalem and shone that light and then shot back up again. I put that in behind you while while you were mm. talking about that. And that was interesting. Oh, I um, I wanted to ask you. 
Well, I've got one question down that I thought of last night. Aside aside from it, because the, the, the doco's got like seven chapters, and at the end of each chapter I put some live footage of you in it, but there was one chapter where we're talking about um, not directly talking to or having anything to do with spirits, um, which is quite different to what you taught in religion. You're taught to rebuke and, you know, tell them off and, you know, <laughs> cast them out and do all sorts of things. So my question was, aside from the command not to be in contact with spirits, do you think there is an actual physical danger in addressing evil spirits or antagonizing them, even though we're believers and obviously not, you know, attempting to worship them or befriend them? Do you think there's a physical danger there or would you just be, I mean, I know we're happy to just obey the command, but do you think there'd be a physical danger? Well, not to a spirit-filled person, but the thing of it is, a lot of non-spirit-filled persons or people are like the, you know, examples we see in Scripture. It says that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. It's speaking about the spiritual connection. But the uh, the ones that are not, that are just listening and they've just learned to mimic, they're not spirit-filled, and Yahushua's not in them. And, you know, that's why they fall away and they convert to atheism or Judaism or whatever. But, uh, yeah, they're in danger. So the general policy that we have to follow is to not speak to the demons, but speak to Yahushua and rebuke the, that he rebuked the demon. And I don't speak to demons directly. I, I'm always looking at him. <laughs> I'm not looking off somewhere else and going, uh, I've got uh, this power. You know, I don't have power. Yahushua has the power. And I always draw on that knowledge that he's the one that has authority and I'm just a vessel that he can operate in. And that's what we are. The uh, Our reasonable servants, our worship, is to offer ourselves to be available. And it has nothing to do with our will. It has to do with his will. So we just turn ourselves over to him. Now, he speaks through us. Yeah. But that's generally the best policy. But, you know, there's an example in the scriptures, and I don't know the exact address right off the top of my head, but the um, people who said in Yahushua who, who Paul speaks of or whatever, uh, I rebuke you, and they're casting out demons. And the person that had the demon said uh, something to the effect that, uh, I know Yahushua, I know, I know Paul, but who are you? <laughs> you know, and then they, it was clobbering time, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, to put it in the in the uh, things jargon, mm. <laughs> Fantastic Four. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's an old one. Clobbering time. I grew, up, I grew up with that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I knew more about that stuff than I did about scripture by far. Yeah, but. Uh, yeah. Anyway, the uh, the spiritual warfare is prayer and us speaking and connecting and staying connected with Yahushua. Pray at all times, you know. And I think that's the best policy. And if anybody's got a better idea than uh, that's superior to that, then I haven't heard of it, you know. But uh, I, I'm always willing to listen. And uh, if there's a better approach, but you know, us going up against the demon. Uh-uh, you know, that's, uh, Paul, I mean, Peter wrote about that. They, uh, he, he, he mentioned it in one of his letters about the, the spiritual realm, and we just can't, because, see, they're, they're a higher creature and a higher order, of, uh, you know, they're able to see us, we're not able to see them, and, you know, they've got abilities we don't have, and, and great power. And uh, we we just can't do that stuff. And they and he and Peter says that it's just ignorance, you know. But uh, I do know this: that the one that's in us, if if he is in us, is is able to handle anything. I mean, by his word. In fact, just by his thought, he's holding all things together, including the existence of the spirit that we're being confronted with. So all he has to do is just sort of forget that spirit exists and it's gone.
<laughs> I mean, God, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, when I pr when I pray for people or demonic strongholds on uh, teachers that I, I pray for, I ask him to rebuke the demon and send the demon out of the person into a pit of darkness for holding, not to bother other people with, but to put that person, that demon or that spirit in a place awaiting judgment day, you know, at the end of the uh, thousand year, uh, the millennium, you know, when everything is judged and uh, including the spirit and uh, they'll all come forth. Even, uh, you know, even the, the dragon, you know, who we call the adversary or Hashatan is going to have to be bound. And I'm, that's what I'm referring to when I pray. But I don't pray to the demon or, or by my own authority say, hey, you know, get over there to this pit or just come out of this person and go bother someone else so that it can come back and bother that person again or bother someone else. Anyway, I wanted you to know that Fossilized Customs 10th edition has just released. The demonic realm is just roaring. I mean, the stuff that's been going on around us. I don't know if you've been feeling it, but mm. there's stuff going on just everywhere around us. Our family, uh, people on uh, uh, things that are happening, the computers, just all sorts of spiritual things. Yeah. Have you noticed anything? Yeah, just in yeah. the last two years? Yeah, we've noticed a lot, a lot. Yeah, feeling and pressure and chaos and yeah, things that... Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, the protection that we're getting, though, is just it must be off the scale because we've we're aware of what they're capable of and yet we're not being touched. They the 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 uh, they must be really aware of what's going on, you know, more so than we really realize. Yeah. But the protection is is wonderful, and I, and I and I know that we all need to pray and thank, be very very thankful for things that we've been protected from. That we have no idea ever even happened, mm. you know. You know, and people, you know, sometimes they'll thank you for this or that, but uh, sometimes we need to just include the things that we don't know about, you know. Yeah, that could have happened and didn't didn't happen. We might find out one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a, mm. it's an awesome thing because we mm. know it's happening, you know, but uh, we don't know what what it is that's going on. Mm. Uh, anyway, with the um, with the section we have a big section about the DUMBs, the DUMBs, the deep underground military bases, and the you said a couple of statements to the effect of that you believe the um, the technology is is probably more than a hundred years advanced underground, the secret cosmic level science and all the things that are going on. Have you heard anything lately? It's been about a year or so since we discussed, and probably two years since you wrote the article. Have you heard anything lately about, uh, because you keep your ear close to the ground with current events, uh, anything genetically or, because you were saying something to the effect of that they, they might breed a superhuman being that Satan can inhabit and possibly that might be the man of sin or the man of lawlessness or something like that. Do you think, have you heard well, anything on them? Nothing new that I've heard of, although I do know that, as many people are aware of, the plant kingdom and the food that they have to buy at the store is, is most often genetically modified. GMO stands for genetically modified organism. And they're messing and meddling with insect DNA and spider DNA and sheep DNA and goats and they're mixing this stuff up with, uh, you know, plant life, and they're they're growing these monstrosities that are part this and part that, and the things that are going on behind the scenes in these uh, genetic labs, and some of them are probably underground. Some of these things that are underground are underground for a purpose, because see if it if these things get out on the surface then there's things that they know will cause, you know, catastrophic death, not only to them, but their families and extended friends and all. So these scientists do a lot of this stuff in labs under the ground. 
you know, they have uh, these levels that they have. And if one level, in fact, there's a movie that you can watch. I know this is just hypothetical stuff, but it's uh, Hollywood has some reflection of what we are doing. I mean, back when they made the movie uh, Frankenstein, you know, electricity was really scary, you know, so it was the, the new threat. But the, the new threats today are probably mostly genetic. And when they show you these labs underground, there's this movie called The Andromeda Strain. Andromeda Strain. And it was made for TV, uh, the new one. The, oh, the first one was kind of primitive, but the new one really brings out a lot of these things, these issues of, of genetic manipulation. And uh, they have these labs underground, and if there's a, the, the, the bigger threats are, are deeper and deeper and different levels. And if something bad happens in one lab, then the upper labs have security measures. And they even have, in some cases, they say, uh, nuclear weapons underneath these labs to completely wipe out whatever it was that was, uh, you know. I mean, you know, they have catastrophic uh, measures that they can take to alleviate the problem if it ever it, it, it develops. But uh, mm -hmm. these, uh, these genetic manip manipulations, like, for example, if you took a, the DNA out of an animal, and you combine it with a human DNA, and you create this monstrosity, it probably can't reproduce, but they can still clone it and make more and more of them, you know, for military purposes and so forth. But you, you put the, uh, the ability, genetic ability, of a spider and a lion and a man mixed together, you have this uh, chimera. It's a chimera. And uh, you unleash these things on the surface of the planet, and they're really wise. They have the mental processes of people, and they call them transhumans. You know, uh, they call them H plus, a human plus something else. And if they get to the point where regular human beings who can reproduce and, and live and breathe on the, on the, and make families... Uh, they'll be, if they ever get to the point where these creatures are out there and they rule us, which I think is starting to maybe come about, it, uh, it, it, it develops into a situation where we're uh, enslaved, you know. And it, and it isn't unlike what happened back in the pre-flood days with the Nephilim, because they were literally tearing into people and eating them, you know, alive eating men and animals. That's what they were doing. So the, uh, the all flesh had become corrupted with this, this genetically modified organism that we read in Scripture as being Nephilim. And it's happening again. And it, only it's happening uh, rapidly because, I mean, just think about it. In 1903, the Wright brothers demonstrated a, a, the flight of a plane just over a hundred feet, and everybody's going, "Wow, this is amazing!" Well, what are we doing now? You know, just a little over a hundred years later, and the genetic world is advanced even further than that. You know, we, we've got the space shuttles and all these uh, <laughs> these craft that can leave the Earth and change their engine combustion to rocket fuel. You know, and then come back into the Earth, and they're going like Mach seven you know, seven times the speed of sound. They can go around the earth, you know, in less than one day or really in like, like 12 hours. But, uh, yeah, there's just, it's just a, you know, the technology is uh, just running away. And wars, wars usually kept that under control for most of the historical periods. But, we don't know what happened before the flood, but there apparently were uh, a rapid development of technological things, not only uh, mechanical, but also genetically. But, uh, you know, he's going to punish those that are destroying his earth, his creation. And he's going to burn it, you know. That's what we know. He, he flooded the first one. 
but he's and that's pretty thorough dis destruction. But he's going to the second time, just before he comes back, he's going to burn the earth thoroughly, you know, and it's going to be roasted in a big way, and uh, we're going to be supernaturally protected, you know, but uh, we don't have that to fear. So if you're hiding, if you're hiding a hundred stories underground, you'll still be burned. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna find them. In mm -hmm. fact, if if they, if even if the fire wasn't gonna get them, he would send his messengers in and take it, take them out. You know, in fact, it's not gonna be much unlike the day that he went into Mitzrayim, you know, Egypt, and he slew the firstborn of man and beast by his spirit and he he can do that they can hide under the rocks deep in the earth in the caves the self man-made caves but they can't hide from him and uh, these creatures that have been you know brought into existence through the corruption of his genetic code of men and animals and birds and spiders and all that uh, they're going to all be uh, be cut off from the earth. You know, I mean, we know this. They don't know this, but I think it's spiritual beings that are actually causing it to happen. Yeah. You um, you said a bit earlier that um, you think it's getting to that point again where we will be ruled over by. Well, how, how is that happening? The super classes. Do you think that they are? Secret monsters, or I'm just being silly. But how do you think? How do you think we're coming to the point where we're going to be ruled over by this genetic thing? Well, most of the people that are plugged into the conspiracy theories, and they're not all theories; they're actually conspiracies. Mm -hmm. But they know that the people that are put up in front of us to talk to us, that are maybe elected or whatever. They know that they're called puppets. They know they're puppets, and the people have to read the screen to know what they're going to say, you know. And they don't know what they're going to say. They just know that they're they're told to show up at a particular place and read the words on the screen. See, the and president's the same. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's it, the the president of our country is just a figurehead. He's just he's just a puppet. But behind mm -hmm. the scenes, there's an organized. A, a, you know, a system of authorities and powers and principalities that are controlling everything, you know. I mean, this thing has been, uh, basically, the uh, I see the spiritual realm, the fallen beings, the fallen Malachim, have been uh, consolidating their powers of every form for a long, long, long time. And the technology is at least a hundred years, if not two or three hundred years, advanced to what we see here. And I mentioned before, one day, Phyllis and I were driving on a on a sunny day to go somewhere to the store or something. And on the expressway, we you know this is a an interstate highway. We saw this object on the back of a trailer, and it had. I don't know, at least 20 axles, because this thing was massive. There was an axle next to an axle, next to an axle, and each one of these things had double tires on them, and they were enormous. And the object that was being carried was not covered. It was some sort of a huge cylindrical drill. It was huge. It was probably atomic powered. And, the, and they say that these things can go through solid rock, and a, a number of feet per minute or, you know, it, it, I mean, it isn't real fast because you're melting rock and it leaves a melted, seamless rock formation. And then they come in and put in their, their communication lines and their uh, rails, you know, and their high speed, sometimes, I guess, magnetic uh, suspension trains because they have, fr they're frictionless. You know, the things that are going on underground, <laughs> you know, we have no idea what what really is happening. But we saw one of these things, I mean, with our own eyes. And it was not a rocket. 
And it, it, certainly a rocket, if it were a rocket, it wouldn't weigh enough to require so many axles on this truck. Because they designed these things to be featherweight, you know, you know. I mean, there's just, it, this thing was unbelievable. It, it was beyond uh, our comprehension. Phyllis uh, didn't know what to say. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've been studying the stuff, you know, the underground, uh, deep underground military bases. And uh, there's been people that have said that they've heard voices deep down in the, in the earth where they were working to work to build these things. And they heard screams that were like horrifying, bone chilling, you know, enormous quantities of people screaming, you know, and they didn't know what it was, you know, <laughs> but they reported it. And one of the gentlemen that said he heard it himself was in one of our seminars and he, he made a comment to the audience and, uh, you know, we were, we were all just, you know, shook to our roots because we knew he was telling the truth. This, this was an authentic witness to something that was going on that was underground that he was employed to work with, which they pay fabulous wages for, by the way, if, if you're looking for a good job. <laughs> Can't work with aliens. <laughs> <laughs> well, spiritual beings is what they really are. That's right. Using genetically mani manipulated materials in order to inhabit them. You know, that's what they're really doing. Because these things are not real. They're making people that look just like us that they can inhabit. Because see, the the, the strong man, which we are, see, this is our house. And there's a, the strong man that lives in this house is me. But if there's no strong man in there, if there's an empty shell that they've just cloned, then the, then the spirit can come in and operate it just like a, well, a spirit's operating mine. You know, I have Yahusha in here and I have myself. So the, these two spirits are in this body operating it. And when I get out of bed, and put my feet on the floor, from that point on, I'm under control, but not by a demon, by the mind of Mashiach, my, by, by Yahushua. And then if I start pulling away from him and saying, no, turn right, turn left, then I'm going, you know. Uh, but you see, these things that they're creating are empty shells. And, they, and it's like a ghost is operating the, us, I mean, we're, we're spirits, and we're, if we want to call ourselves a ghost, but if, if we're spiritual beings, primarily, and we're operating physical equipment that's biological. Well, this biological equipment is manufactured, it's developed and grown, and then it, having no strong man there, the demon just comes in and operates it, and can interact with the physical world, you know. That's really what's going on. And uh, they're uh, able to get things done the way they want them. And, of course, these people that you hear of that can speak eight languages fluently, uh, what's that about? Is that, I mean, how are you going to do that? Because, you know, if you're that brilliant, then what are you doing buying all those lies? You know, if, if the Jesuit general can speak all these different languages, it's more likely that he's inhabited by an ancient being. In fact, one of the things that I heard about him, and I can't remember exactly what the languages were, but it seems like most of the languages that he speaks are ancient languages, which is kind of weird. Mm. Talking about the current and, Jesuit uh, general. Yeah. And so who's he going to be talking with? Mm. You know? If you know those languages, how did you learn them? Unless you're demonically possessed. Who do you need them and who are you going to communicate with? Hmm. What hmm. other person? Other demons. Hmm. That's who. So you see, the higher up you get in this, well, you see, what they're doing is they're consolidating their power. You know, you see the pyramid that Adam Weishaupt developed with the eye on the top. It's really just a few eyes up there that are really controlling things, but there, there's over time fewer and fewer and fewer of people are making all the major decisions for all of us, and that's what we all sense everywhere on the planet. 
We all know this is happening. It's consolidation of power. Here in the United States, just when the last pharaoh or president took over, he appointed all these men called czars who were czars? Isn't that Russian? You know, well, it's actually an ancient word, Khazar. It means uh, ruler, you know, uh, Khazar, czar. Uh, anyway, the czar of the tobacco uh, thing and the, the czar of the automobile world and the czar of this and the czar of that. All these dozens of czars. Nobody's ever heard of anything like this. What's that about? It's like this little cluster of little eyes at the top of the pyramid are all going, I'm a czar, and I'm a czar, and I'm a czar too. And you know what? You guys are going to have to do what this guy says. You know, it's a consolidation of powers. You know, they're making all the important decisions for us, but they're also making it a penalty under almost, really under penalty of death or life imprisonment if you don't go along with them, you know. But it's demonic, you know. And, uh, but you see, because they don't love us, but you see, when Yahushua returns, that little game is going to end, you know. And the demonic spirits that have been, been holding this whole earth hostage for 6,000 plus years are going to be cast into a pit of darkness, and held there until the day of judgment, you know, and they know this, but uh, they're still going to fight and try to destroy as much as they can. And you know, in the last hundred or so years, uh, Pol Pot, uh, Adolf Hitler, Stalin killed hundreds of millions of their own people, you know, Hussein. and caused the death of war. Hussein, mm. yeah, those mm. people don't love anybody. And you know, like I was saying, Torah is the school. And love is the lesson. Yeah. But, uh, so you think it's a spiritual place where, where he's holding these uh, spirits? You don't People who say they've gone down deep holes and heard people screaming down there, I don't mean the, the deep underground military bases. I mean other places where people might be in canyons and they think they can hear people screaming and they say, oh, that's evil spirits when they, got, they get thrown into a pit or old uh, Nephilim of old who have been chained up and all these things they say... You, you don't think that's a physical thing? Well, it would probably be possible that it is spiritual. Uh, of course, I don't have first-hand knowledge of that. I try to stay away from demons <laughs> and yeah. big holes in the ground. And yeah. I uh, don't go to the Grand Canyon because I'm afraid I might see a dog fly over the thing with a Frisbee. Yeah. <laughs> but they don't know. Yeah. You know. I mean, we're that stupid, too. You know. But uh, I, I stay away from big holes. Yeah. And cliffs. In fact, when I watch a movie, I'm really afraid when I see these big, <laughs> oh man, waterfalls and big cliffs. And uh -uh. you know, I know they're not really there. Sometimes they are, but you know, it's, uh, I just don't have firsthand knowledge, but it could be that it is uh, the spirits that are crying out because they can manifest themselves mm. to an extent. And if they're down in pits and they're being held in forbidding zones or places where they're trapped, then uh, they're immortal. They can't, in other words, they're deathless. But they can only be killed by Yahuwah, not by one another. And he can only be, uh, you know, I mean, the messenger Gabriel that was impeded, that was sent by Yahuwah to go visit Daniel, was impeded for a period of time. And uh, that was a demonic uh, spirit that he was up against. So we uh, we know that they can impede one another, but they and they do exist in space and time. However, uh, they are deathless. I mean, immortal. They have immortality. But the fallen Malachim are still unable to be killed and they're certainly more powerful than we are and they are here on this planet in fact if we were able to have our eyes open to see where, where, where what's really going on it would be uh, ferocious you know yeah surrounding everybody yeah it's a it's a blessing that we can't see it mm. you know mm. because the ugliness and the hate and uh, and so forth 
But when people allow those creatures, those spirit beings, to come into their bodies and take hold of them, and these witches that go after uh, and pursue communication with them, uh, they're just being toyed with, and they don't even know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. It was just a, a, a about three days ago. Somebody came into the shop and uh, the store and asked me if if we had any more of those uh, tarot cards. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, we don't have any tar tarot cards. We we, we want to get some Torah cards. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that, I haven't had any printed up yet. I'd like to design some if I had time to do it. But uh, just take the Ten Commandments and put them on cards, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't have any, uh, like, I know most of the population is asleep. And I know, yeah. I know as a young person, you don't tend to fear these sort of things. But you've said before that we're this close to being enslaved. Do, do you fear, and I know down in Australia, we just don't think that way at all it's just no nothing's coming around here it was so far away from wherever there's drama generally but um do you think we're close do you fear slavery or things happening fema camps or things coming into the do you have fear about that or do you think that because of your age you, you won't be around to see it or what, what do you is it your opinion on that well, I do. I am mostly concerned for my sons and my grandchildren, but uh, it can happen quickly. Uh, you know, Nazi Germany didn't take very long. They disarmed the population first. That's the first step. And they take all the weapons away. Then only the bad guys have weapons. And then the crime rate quadruples because we're, all the people are victims. All the law-abiding uh, law people obey the law, and they give their guns up, and then all the criminals uh, take the opportunities that uh, they can. And uh, anyway, the, the thing that uh, would probably happen is uh, they would probably round up uh, the military-trained people, people that had military training and were retired from the military first, and uh, eliminate them because see I'm one of those I have training and knowledge but others have even more than I do because I was trained in other areas than how to kill people but uh, everybody knows how to kill people you know <laughs> but uh, the military people usually have their consciences uh, seared and uh, they'll uh, likely uh, be their biggest threat so I think that'll be the first step and then after that they have to do something with the starving masses and round them up and just, you know, because they want to depopulate the entire planet. Because, see, we, we're approaching 7 billion, and to them, they, they talk about us as being useless eaters and consumers of the resources of the planet. So they want to save the resources for the future, and so they want to annihilate if necessary, and I imagine they'll do it biologically. You know, yeah. but for the most part, but uh, because they've they've got ways of spraying us and putting binary and trinary weapons, biological weapons, where one side of the uh, biological weapon can be you know, can be embraced and taken into they themselves, but if they don't get the second component, then they they won't die at all. It'll just wear off. But when the people get marched in to receive mandatory inoculations or capsules or whatever it is they wanted to drink or they put it in the water, one side of the biological weapon can be put into something like the water. And then the other side of the biological weapon can have a time-released effect and then they can wipe out a large percentage of the population of the earth. And they're doing it uh, and they're, well, they've been testing it with all sorts of uh, hemorrhagic uh, uh, viruses and things like that that'll kill almost within hours. Flesh-eating disease that can consume a, a cubic inch in one hour of flesh. You know, and they say, oh, that's terrible. That, that person went to the hospital and they were uh, subjected to some kind of a superbug. And that baby... Uh, 
ate his face. And then it ate his whole, you know. And here's the thing. Who, do, who knows if that wasn't just a, a, a level four experiment? You know, uh, who knows? But the thing of it is that they can unleash that on large populations. And the uh, thing they'll probably do is blame some other group like, oh, you know who did that? Those people over in Afghanistan did <laughs> You know, they're living in those huts, and they've been dreaming this stuff up, and they want us dead. We need more war. <laughs> want it from the Koreans. Let's go get them. But it's not them at all. It's, uh, you know, our own governments, as is always the case. Mm -hmm. Stalin killed his own population. Yeah. Pol Pot killed his own population. You know, see, they, they, they're, they, what they do is they, they consolidate the power in a few people. And that's what these czars are all about here, see. And we're in sector one of the new 10-sector global plan New World Order. I mean, I'm living in North America. This is where the sector one is. The United Nations building was here. You know, that's who it really is. It's the Jesuits. You know, the Jesuits uh, are controlling, well, they've been controlling the inside of the, of the Catholic circus, for hundreds of years, first the Catholic popes tried to, you know, uh, disarm them and did away with them, you know, and then up they come again and spring forth as the Illuminati when they were sanctioned, you know, then they come out as another name. And then, uh, of course, uh, they're, they are the United Nations. They're the World Bank. They're all the Federal Reserve Systems. They control the money supply. And that's the first thing they did with the euro. They created a universal currency. Let's get everybody on a level playing field so everybody's using our currency. And the, that's the global system of finance. And then when they get everybody on that board, then they can connect everybody together politically. And, you, and they, uh, it was, you know, it's all for unity, you know. And it sounds great. What a great plan. But the nations... Uh, are going to eventually wake up and go, what? Wait a minute. <laughs> because, see, Babylon is going to fall. And Babylon would be a government, you know. You know, and it would probably be, and I suspect, if I had to get the right answer, it would be the United Nations. Because the charter doesn't empower any people or population, it only empowers it. It just focuses power within itself. And it all, it uses nice, cozy little words to make it sound beautiful. But it's not, it, it, you know, utopian. But it's not. It's actually designed to focus power. But you see, all it takes for our government here in the United States is for some puppet that's up there to sign a treaty with the United Nations, and then our sovereignty is gone. It just, it's gone. The Constitution is the greatest enemy that we have. The Constitution of the United States is the greatest enemy of the Jesuits because it gives us freedom of conscience, you know. But you see, the, if you just read the thing, the few, first few sentences, that's an abomination to the Jesuits. You see, they want to tell you what you believe and control every aspect of your life from cradle to grave and they always have because the dragon the spirit of the dragon is within them and gives them the power see because the the beast gets its power from the dragon and it's a spiritual power yeah if all the uh, politicians and president and everybody are just puppets then why do you think it's taking so long why don't they just do it well, they're they're going to, and they're going to they're going to they're going to flip the switch one of these days, and these treaties are going to be signed, and it's going to be over. You know, they're just basically the the demons are getting everything in line, and they don't care how many people die. In fact, that the more people die, the better for them, because they they hate human beings. You know, they really think they want. Witches and sorcerers, they think that the demons are their friends, but they're not. You know, they're just uh, laughing at them, you know. 
But uh, when, why don't they do it? Yeah, when, it's a matter of when, not so much if. But, uh, you know, I think Yahushua's, uh, the, Jacob's trouble, as they call it, or Yaakov's trouble, is uh, probably going to involve the trigger point in, in Israel because Iran and its proxy wars through all the other surrounding countries with Israel, all these missiles that are flying into Israel all the time, they're coming from one or two sources, you know. And they're probably Iranian and Russian, you know, because there's a huge uh, amount of money to be made for Russia, or uh, Iran from Russia. And, uh, you know, all these weapons that are blowing up on the roadside bombs and, and all these missiles, they're all coming from one place, and our government knows it, you know. But our our government's not been uh, willing to uh, to stop it. But North Korea is in the equation. I mean, there's a North Korea is a is a rogue country. But you know, these that's just the political thing. All all the governments on the earth are basically just gangs, with their flag and their gang colors flying. And then the syndicate of the gangs is the United Nations. And that's what it's really all about. We're just captive populations supporting these gang leaders. You know, you know what I'm saying? Because they really are not out for our protection. Some of them are. There are people that are working in government that are good people. Of course, they're people. But they, uh, they, are, they, don't, they unknowingly serve a purpose that they, it, it's being steered towards an evil uh, consolidation of power. You know, of course, so you know, they, need, they need to shut people like me up and say, what, what are you doing? That's the same stuff that that other guy said. We killed him for that. Well, too bad. You can't hurt me. I mean, you know, if you kill the messenger, it's not going to stop the message, you know. But, uh, I mean, I love you. I love the, the poor people that are misguided. But, you know, it's about, it's about love. It's, if you miss this point right here, you've gone too far. <laughs> love is the lesson. And uh, if, you, if you see somebody uh, doing something wrong, it's probably because they're just misguided. You know, people are stealing from one another and, and saying bad things about one another, you know. But... Uh, that's not why we're here. So Yahushua's going to have to come back earlier, I think. <laughs> earlier? <laughs> be no one left. I think he knows, think he knows when he's coming back. Mm. But mm. Uh, when he was here on the earth, he didn't. He withheld that information from his body, so he wouldn't reveal that to them. Because his love is so great for us that there's nothing that can separate us from him. See, that's the good news about it. We're not holding on to him. He's holding on to us. Wow. From inside. And that's the nice thing. So we're secure. And we're happy. We're not angry. We're not trying to hurt people and say, oh, I better kill you because you might hurt me. <laughs> that's not, well, that, that's the wrong pattern of thinking. You know, we just, if everybody on the planet if everybody said, whatever I was thinking, I was probably wrong. Let's look at the Torah and learn how to love one another. If they all did that, they could do it within a matter of weeks. And they'd all get the message and they'd say, well, let's go ahead and do this. And maybe Yehuda will destroy the earth. You know, and he wouldn't. He's, because we're not here for him to punish us. We're sons and daughters. We're his children. But the beast can hurt us, you know. Right now, the, the, the fallen Malachim are all around us. You know, they're running the, the show. Yeah, but there's a limited number of them, but they're only one-third of the, of the heavenly forces. And the good news is that there's two-thirds on our side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But, you know, Yahuwah, Yahuwah can protect us just because he wants to. Mm. He doesn't need a messenger to do it, mm. you know. So but that's why we're we, he's in us, so we're very fearful for for these people, uh, yeah. these fallen beings. Mm. So there's no you don't have to be afraid. There's no fear in perfect love. 
That's a scripture, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Perfect love casts out all fear. Mm. Because we don't have to be afraid of Yahuwah, but the demons have to be afraid of us mm. because he's mm. in us. Mm. So they can fear us. Mm. They have to flee. Yeah. We resist them, and they're gone. They're out of there. They're going, whoops. <laughs> that one's over. Yeah. Let's not mess with that. Let's go somewhere where we can have some more fun. Mm. You know. Although they're more not, they're not so much into fun. They're into hate. Yeah. You know. And you know that's why Yahusha was very easy to understand for some of us. You know, if you look for the fruit, you identify the tree by looking at the fruit of the tree. And when you see bad fruit, you know that you've got a bad tree because a good tree can't produce bad fruit. And what was the Inquisition all about that lasted 600 years? What was that about? Was that good fruit? Were they saving people's souls? And, you know, destroying their bodies by fire? And, you know, uh, because they wouldn't believe in a little piece of bread being their physical presence? When, when, they, when they laid that little disc of bread on someone's tongue, that poor person was so deceived because they would say, the body of Christ. Well, that could be taken a number of ways, but we're the body of Messiah, not a piece of bread. Mm. You know? And that was a deception that I lived with for most of my teenage years and my even younger than that, because that's what they do. They give you this thing called the First Communion, and that is a very, very special thing. Everybody's all freaked out and excited. And they're going, oh, he's going to receive the Messiah's flesh. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that's uh, not what Passover is, really, you know, when you're observing Passover. You know, you're receiving, because Yahushua is the Passover. Yeah. But uh, when he, he broke the bread, he said, remember that this is my body, broken and given for you. Mm -hmm. Take and eat. Mm -hmm. And he's not talking, but, it, but metaphorically, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a remembrance. And they do it every Sunday morning, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And more often, too. I mean, they do it daily, really. There's a daily thing they call a mass. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, it's all spiritually demonic mm. in his way it is. Because wow. there is no such thing as a sacrament. Mm -hmm. A sacrament does not exist. It's just a fabrication, you know. Mm. The, a doctrine of demons. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing, brother. Mm. So you don't go driving around Area 51 very often? <laughs> well, no, no. It's too far away from you anyway, isn't it? Oh, well, yeah, I wouldn't go over there because the super volcano's over there. That's right. Yeah. Sister, uh, Sister Pam lives there, doesn't she? Doesn't she live she's got, I think she's sitting right in the middle of the, uh, of the, well, she's in Florida most of the time, but yeah. I don't know if most of the time is the right answer, but yeah, she's, uh, she's got a residence uh, there in the middle of the cauldron, of, or the caldera of the volcano. It's a huge caldera. It's the biggest one on the planet that I know of. Wow. She wants to get some good photos when it happens. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's going to be pretty serious when that blows. If it blows, yeah. It probably will, too. Yeah. But, uh, the fire is going to ignite a lot of stuff, and it's going to break up the earth. It says the earth is going to reel like a drunkard, mm. you know. Wow. And, uh, mm. we're a gonna, lot of underground tunnels. Yeah, we're going to have to talk about that in, in another tour talk about the... The sun, the day of Yahuwah, the sun coming in and then, you know, that would be, because yeah. you're all about, I love that. That was a good study. Mm. Yeah, that's that's amazingly mm. amazing. Well, is there anything else we can uh, cover about this? Oh, I, I think I got all the answers I wanted. I don't know how long, oh. I've, been, I don't know how long I've been chatting for, but that's great. Yeah? Yeah. Well, yeah. Mm. I mean, uh, it's obvious that, uh, you know, if you read... Yehuda, what they call Jude, chapter 1, verse 6, and the messengers who did not keep their first principality left their own dwelling. Now, that's interesting. Mm. And uh, there's uh, a lot of translational possibilities there, but it, uh, it does say that there is going to be a judgment on the great day, you know, of these 
messengers that did not keep their first principality. In other words, they left their, their original dwelling and came into our realm mm. disobediently, you know. Mm. So that's amazing. Mm. Wow. That's amazing. But the demonic things that are going to that are going on, if you see any of them, email me and let me know what's happening. Yeah. Uh, but you know, we, I know that we're protected, all of us, because mm. we're all praying, you know, to to be safe. And, mm. You know, so uh, if you see something funny that just doesn't seem normal, mm. yeah. <laughs> it's it's demonic. Yeah. You know, and I know that sometimes it's electronic, but that can be demonic too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just watch Transformers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's wonderful, well, brother. Thank you for making this available. Yeah. It'll be fun to see what you can do with it. Yeah, see what we come up with. Okay. Love you, mate. Well, love you. Bye bye. Yeah. See you later. We're told not to fear. Do not fear. Yahusha is going to have his way. However, we should realize that fallen Malachim can possess anyone. And they want to ruin your day. Anybody who does not have Yahusha's spirit in them can come at you. But remember, we're not fighting flesh and blood. We always have to wear our armor. We're supposed to love people, even though they might do the opposite to us. So Israel shall be protected. Those in Yahusha and covenant will be protected. How do you get into Israel? Repent for your lawlessness. Realize what Yahushua did for you on that stake and repent for your sins. And then be immersed. Be immersed in the only saving name of Yahushua. Go into the water and realize that your old self is dying and you are going to come up into newness of life. And then the Father and the Son will live within you. That's the set apart spirit. And he will love you and guide you. And he'll flog you and chastise you at times. But we have to be in Torah. That's how you get grafted into Israel, into the vine, into Yahusha. He only made a covenant with Israel. And the Ten Commands that he gave at Sinai are the covenant. That's what we live by. So we need to be obedient to Torah people. That's how we stay protected and how we don't have to fear. Because if we're checking our thoughts, see it? Check your thoughts, 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 thoughts. Check your thoughts. Because the fallen Malachim come to our thoughts. Even though we've been immersed, even though we're in Israel, even though we are of Yahusha, they can come to our thoughts. But if we're walking in Torah, if we're checking our thoughts and not letting them flood into us, then we will have love. We will have the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, all the rest. We will have that in our day because we're guarding the Torah. Scripture says to guard the Torah in our hearts. So I want to leave you with that tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, fellow Israelites, be aware of your immortality and be aware that if you are in Yahusha, you have everlasting life. Hallelujah and so be it. I know you. Listening. Listening.